All right. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us today um, for part, our next uh, part of our webinar series, Automation, um, How to Manage Your AP Tax Compliance Challenges. Thank you all again for joining us today. We will be here for an hour. Um, hopefully, we'll do a presentation of about 50 minutes and give us some time for uh, questions at the end. Um, if you look on the on your uh, webinar screen, there is a box that you can type in questions. If you have a question, please type it in. We will wait till the end to answer those questions, um, but you can certainly submit your questions throughout the uh, event. As I said, uh, we will do our best to leave 10 minutes at the end, but when Chuck and I start talking about taxes, we get a little crazy. Um, sure so enough. If we do go long, uh, we will answer questions afterwards uh, by writing. So, All right. So for today's agenda, we'll do some introductions. Uh, we'll talk about common issues in the AP process, um, you know, across industries and, and some other things that we see. Uh, how to take control um, of those of some of those issues and some of those processes, uh, and then actually we'll, we'll end up um, in talking about some of the, the solutions here at, at um, Sovos that you may be able to utilize um, or get to think about um, in terms of helping manage the process internally uh, in your business. So I'm Matthew Walsh. I'm principal of indirect tax at Sovos. I have now been with Sovos for coming up on 18 years, um, focusing on sales use as well as value-added tax compliance. Uh, joining me today is Charles Maniacci. Hey, everybody. So my name is Chuck Maniacci. I'm the director of the regulatory analysis team. And what that means is that I'm, uh, I'm responsible for the group that, that supports all the rates and rules and content in all the... Um, in all the Sovos uh, technology offerings directed at at, uh, at tax and regulatory compliance. I've been here not quite as long as Matt, 15 years, uh, but I'm grateful to Matt because Matt hired me uh, some 15 years ago. So thank you, Matt. <laughs> Brought him into the world of sales tax and he hasn't stopped thanking me since. <laughs> all right. uh, so today's uh, webinar is um, open for CPE credits. So our first polling question is, will you be applying for CPE credits for this webinar? Uh, please answer. To get CPE credits, you do need to answer all of the polling questions. There are five of them, including this one, um, as we go. And none of them are quizzes, so don't worry. All right. And as you're answering that question, uh, let's let's uh, start a bit. And, and the first section, as I said, we'll talk about just some common AP challenges. And Chuck, why don't you? Uh, sorry about that. We lost my. There we go. Okay, so let's talk a little bit. Let's level set a little bit about what use tax is, what it isn't, and what makes use tax compliance so challenging. So, I, I here in my in my role at Sovos, I'm always teaching people about the basics of sales tax, and I always sort of treat use tax as sales taxes a uh, relatively closely related cousin. And, and what makes sales and use tax compliance unique is that liability is joint in several. And that's kind of unique to, to, to U.S. indirect tax regimes. And what that means, of course, is that if the seller doesn't do it right, that doesn't mean the obligation goes away, or if the seller has no obligation to do it all, that obligation doesn't go away. The obligation just switches to the consumer to make a self-assessment of use tax um, based on the law. It's this concept of joint and several liability. The seller doesn't get it right. The obligation doesn't go away. It falls on you as the purchaser. And as businesses, that liability is real and it's serious. So I'll often talk to the individuals and ask them, when they buy something in Massachusetts, in New Hampshire, do they assess use tax uh, when they bring it to their house in Massachusetts? The answer is generally no. And then they get all of a sudden a little bit concerned. And I tell them, well, your liability isn't that, your risk isn't that great. But for companies, the risk is actually enormous. And all our experience and all our discussions with clients over the years have revealed a very serious audit risk and audit liability on the AP side. Auditors going in for a sales tax audit know, of course, every one of them knows about AP uh, liability on use tax, and they know to look for it. They know use tax compliance is particularly challenging, and they're always ready, willing, and able to go after it in the context of, of an audit. For example, 
we'll talk about this uh, in the course of the presentation, but P cards, managing the use tax liability on P cards is particularly challenging, and auditors will, in fact, as part of their normal process, usually ask for uh, a sampling or a history of P card transactions. And the other thing that we've seen out there in talking with our clients and interacting with the taxpaying public at large is that auditors have become fairly formalistic, one might say persnickety in their approach. Maybe I would just say persnickety in their approach. And and what that means is that it's it's not only the fact that you did it right, it's the fact that you have to prove what you did and why. So, for example, if you're uh, going to contend to an auditor that you know, owed no use tax liability on this particular item because it was transported out of the jurisdiction and not within the reach of the auditing jurisdiction, you're probably going to have to go a long way to demonstrate with documentation that indeed that's the case. And that's really kind of the regulatory environment we find ourselves today, which makes use tax compliance, I think, particularly important. Yeah. And remember, Chuck, here, the mistakes here are a direct cost on the business, right? So these are, if, you know, there's, there's two issues, right? Either underpaying, not accruing what you should, or overpaying your vendors. Um, and both of those are a cost of business. So if you overpaid your vendors, that's tax you didn't need to pay. It comes right out the bottom line. If you're under, under accruing and you are, are found out on audit, again, you need to pay that. But then you also then get removed in with penalties and interest. So, you know, these issues are a direct cost on, on, on the, the business itself and, and not passed along. And, of course, Matt, there are ways to get that back through reverse audits and engaging with consultants and all that stuff. But that can be expensive and time-consuming as well. So let's think about some of the industries that are particularly impacted by AP. And I think if you were to create a spectrum of organizations that have AP uh, tax compliance concerns, you would definitely put manufacturers at the top of that list. And the reason, for anybody on this call that's in the manufacturing space, the reasons why you're top of the list, I think, are fairly, are fairly evident. There's, across the country, there's a patchwork of exemptions uh, and exclusions to which you may or may not be entitled based on what you're manufacturing, where you're manufacturing it, how you're manufacturing it, what part of the process is the item used in, is it used in production, or is it used in quality control, is it used in testing, is it used in pollution control, how much of it is used, is it used primarily, or is it used exclusively, is it completely and totally absorbed during production. All these rules exist, and they exist most everywhere in the country, and the rules by which they're applied are very nuanced. You know them best, it's your business, your vendors will likely know them least because it's not their business. Right, right, right. And even if the state has, a, you know, two states have the same exemption as we know, the definitions can be different. And so how that actually applies jurisdiction by jurisdiction gets pretty tricky. Indeed. And, and retailers, so I know by looking at the attendance list, I know there are a couple of retailers out there. Thank you for coming. <laughs> and uh, you might not necessarily think of retail as having an enormous use tax liability, but they do. Uh, and it's funny because it might actually be neglected. Um, because it's not thought of as being job number one. Um, and really here, especially some of the larger retailers out there, especially those retailers that are expanding and opening up new offices and, and growing their geographic reach, uh, new locations, uh, you know, things like store build-outs, uh, extending shelving and other items uh, to help build out the store from location A to location B has a lot of use tax challenge associated with it. Promotion, promotional items, damaged items, items that you buy to give away, displays that you use across multiple locations, all of those things have a major use tax component to it, which you might not necessarily be at front of mind, because when you think of retail, you don't think of use tax, you think of sales tax. Right. And Chuck, it's interesting. We were, I was just on site with a, a large retailer just a few weeks ago. They're doing a, a, re, you know, a new tax project. And, and one of the main drivers is bringing AP into the fold and, and automating that. It's something that they haven't done. They always considered or always looked at the sales side and make sure that the tax in charge of the customers is correct. And now they've decided to look internally. Uh, and then we had another one where they were looking to allocate across all their stores, there's over 200 stores, um, advertising and marketing costs right. am amongst the stores. So, you know, very complex in terms of doing that and how do you get that done. 
but it's definitely a lot of retail issues that, that we are seeing more and more retailers think about use tax, which, which is great. So why, why, if use tax is such a known commodity and it's challenging and it's risky and it's actually costing companies money, why haven't companies done anything about it? And the fact is that it's hard to address. The challenges uh, facing automating purchasing are substantial and, uh, and, and known. And, and simply put, it's a hard uh, nut to crack. And what makes it hard is the environment. Whether that environment is centralized or decentralized, both present challenges. And the challenges are, are really the level of involvement of the people uh, performing this purchasing function, their clear priorities and directives, and the importance of tax in that role. So plain and simple, people on the purchasing side, uh, side job number one is to get items, is to, is to purchase the items at the right price, in the time they need it to get this company going where it needs to go. Their tax considerations on purchasing are simply not priority number one. In fact, most often the case, tax is not in any way involved in the purchasing side of the business. Purchasing actually might sit outside of the United States and, 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 and tax may have little to no line of sight into this um, into this arm that's constantly engaging in transactions and could, for the sake of expediency, um, be making tax mistakes. Right, right. And I just point out, Chuck, you know, and that's, you know, purchasing organizations, their job is to, again, make sure you, you're getting your purchase in, you're paying the invoices quickly and on time, mm -hmm. get those, those discounts if they're available. Um, or at least not paying late. Or at least not paying late. <laughs> um, and taxes is not often a driver of, of that for, right. the, for the purchasing organization. Um, with that, let's talk about or go to our second polling question and just get a feel for who's listening today and just ask me, you know, what type of a business are you? Are you a manufacturer? Are you a retailer? Are you in software, high tech, uh, financial services, or other? And while that poll is open, um, we'll start talking about now coming up, you know, issues that we see in the in the AP process as we talk to our clients and 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 are out, you know, gathering information. Um, so, so Matt, that's that's funny. Um, indeed, as as the polling questions complete, it does look like the majority of people out there right now listening are manufacturers. manufacturers. Not surprising, but also good to see that there are indeed a healthy subsection of retailers. retailers yep, <clears throat> and and also some financial services folks and some high tech folks. So we're we're spanning the spanning the industries, which is which is <laughs> nice. So again, as you know, everybody's talking now about data, big data, and, and how to, you know, um, optimize business. And, you know, there's a quote here from, uh, from someone from PwC talking about, you know, the tax threshold of the future will be very proficient in data and analysis and stats, um, as well as technology. But it's interesting, as we go out and we chat with our clients in, 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 in the industry, really when it comes to the AP side, we see things fall into four buckets, and these four buckets, and we'll, and we'll take them, you know, one at a time. As, as we go. And the first is, as you talk about the, the process, they'll say, we have no process, right? Um, it's, you know, the invoices come in, they get paid, no one's really checking to make sure they're accurate, no one's checking to see if we overpaid or underpaid. Fingers um, crossed. Fingers crossed, essentially, <laughs> right? And, you know, it's obviously the, the risky approach, right? Um, oftentimes, there's multiple purchasing avenues, data, you know, or purchases are being made across the organization with really no clear internal process. Um, there's multiple people making purchasing decisions, and there's really no review um, of that of that end-to-end -end process. And then what happens is it becomes a continuing issue on audit, and people will set aside reserves because they know this is a problem. Um, it's a, and as Chuck said, this can be a, a tricky, hard nut to <laughs> crack. Mm -hmm. And so the thought is, well, maybe those audits don't seem so big. But we'll so we'll reserve and, and really just kind of hope for the best. The next option we see, or the next uh, process we see, is more of a manual process. And so now they are taking some control here. Um, they're starting to pull in some purchasing information, you know, in Textile or some you know some similar program that gives them some sort of type of review. And then there is a review. The review tends to be ad hoc. Uh, meaning it's up to the person reviewing or maybe the head of tax to say, you know what, if that invoice is over $10,000, look at it. Or if it's coming out of this region or this department, let's take a look and see how that's, that's worked. 
um, or how that how that looks. But it's pretty inconsistent. It's not looking at every invoice. You can't look at every invoice. It is a manual process. Um, and, and so there's certainly you know gaps in, in terms of what is found and, and what the issues are. And it doesn't really provide any upstream controls. So there's no changes to the process upstream um, as as products are ordered or as you know and, and a PO is paid. There's really nobody looking to make sure that's correct. Um, but there is some check at the at the back end to, to look at the bigger invoices or again some region or some known problem. And there's some appeal to that, right, Matt? You could you could direct that manual energy to the vendors you know are particularly bad mm -hmm. or to a cost center or to a part of your organization which you know has significant risk. Mm -hmm. And that and that gives you some ability to at least stem the the flood of of of, of, of bad audit results. Right. And what it does so if you, if it's a known risk and a no a known vendor that you have an issue with, then fine. But then there's a bunch of vendors that could actually slip through the cracks because right. they're not known. No. So, but again, it is the start of a process, and, it, and it's taking some control. Uh, the next one we have is you know varying processes where you know maybe the recurring purchases you know coming through the, the main financial system are reviewed or looked at, but there's some other non-standard AP flows, some one-off transactions. Uh, Chuck mentioned P cards earlier, so. Uh, and I think across the board, P cards tend to be a, a challenging area to, to validate and to check for a lot of a lot of businesses. Um, and that's one that you may see, you know, again, everything come out of SAP gets checked, but there's these other various systems out there that are that are not in that same process, and they either don't get checked or they get checked sporadically. Um, or you have some very old systems that aren't plugged into the main ERP system that kind of sit out on their own or it's a new acquisition sits out on its own, and so there's not one standardized process across the whole organization. So Matt, and when we talk to our customers and we think about their varying processes, like which ones are avoided? Is it P cards, is it T&E? Well, what, what is the one, like if they're, not, if they're doing something and it varies, like which one are they putting aside because it's just too darn hard? Uh, I think that it varies business to business based on you know, their own internal Issues, quite honestly, um, P cards always comes up as a question. Uh, I think across the board, I haven't come across anybody yet who says, "Oh, P cards are easy and it's not not a problem. We can make that work." Um, the other one seems to be, you know, it's an acquisition that they made that sits on a separate ERP or a, right. an older legacy ERP system that they haven't been able to sort of rein in yet, um, or it's again a, a T and E expense or someone that has an outside purchasing. System um, that is not tied connected to the, anything. Yeah, connected to anything. Yeah. Uh, and then the final issue we see is sort of just data insight. So you may be doing some sort of process and, and looking at some things, but um, the challenge is that there's multiple systems involved. There's multiple places where data is located. Uh, the data is not consistent in terms of the structure and the information that it contains, and there's not enough detail. We often find, or not all five, but you know, we've come across where you can't get the data, right? Maybe tax wants to see some data, but there's other departments involved, and they protect that data as their own, and are, you know, have a hard time sharing it for various reasons, um, you know, and for that data that is available, nobody's reviewing it, and and or a lack of sufficient tools to analyze and and, and extract the information that you really need or analyze that data. So, processes in place, some systems in place, but really. Again, nobody's taking all that information and, and calling it down into one location to be able to do some some analysis on it and to understand what's going on. So, so Matt, Matt, you make a great point there that you may have all the data in the world, but if it's just in this one massive spreadsheet and there's no tool, whether that tool be handmade or, or purchased, to actually analyze the information and use it to make decisions, it just becomes a, a daunting like like boulder to push up a hill. It almost becomes not worth the effort, right? Exactly, exactly. And I was uh, actually not in this deck or in this presentation. Um, I do have a, some some information on data analytics and so on. That, and one of the the facts that we pulled out was of all the data that's created, less than 0.5 percent or 0.05 percent is actually used. So there's a lot of data being created, but being able to use it is is a challenge. So with that, let's jump into our next polling question. Um, which group in your organization manages your AP tax compliance process? So 
obviously AP manages AP, but is there a tax compliance process in there and who manages that process? Is it the AP team? Is it the tax department? Is it finance? Multiple departments? Or I don't know. Or it could be no one. Or, or, or no one. <laughs> <laughs> I think no one would fall under I don't know. <laughs> I guess right. Right, and as those results are coming in, interesting. So it looks like the majority say the tax department has control on that, which is nice, which is good for this crew. Uh, and I would imagine that if they're listening to this, this webinar, they're a, an organization that does take this, this seriously. Uh, the next one up is multiple departments, and that doesn't surprise me either. You know, a, a combination of tax and finance, or tax and AP, um, managing managing this this challenge. So what are some of the ways now, let's talk about how people um, can, can try to take, take, take some control. And what we'll do is we'll, we'll talk, we'll go from sort of the most basic up to the most robust um, and give some pros and cons along the way. And the first one is essentially creating a, a tax matrix lookup tool. Now, what a tax matrix lookup tool would do is you, you take a, a taxability matrix behind the scenes and you essentially have it out by jurisdiction with T's and E's or, you know, reduced rates, whatever that answer is for various items you're purchasing, pieces of equipment. Um, and then you plug that into a system where the purchasing folks um, can look up what you're buying um, and assign the correct tax determination to that. Right. Some of the uh, advantages are it puts, you know, some process and logic into the flow you know, removes the guesswork out of the AP process somewhat and assures that the tax department has influence on the AP tax decisions um, because they're the ones creating an, an, that matrix. You know, some of the, the concerns or limitations on this process are that it's a static tool, right? It's, a, it's something that needs to be continually reviewed and updated to remain useful. Um, generally, that would fall on the tax department to make sure that they're doing that research mm -hmm. behind the scenes. If, you know, you begin to buy a whole new product line or move into a new area, um, there's a, a lot of research that needs to go into that to make sure that you have those decisions created and in there. Um, and there's still human intervention required so that, yes, there's a, there's a process behind it, but you do need somebody to actually make those decisions. And here's a, an example of what one might look like, a pretty simple thing, right? So you have what are you buying, who is using it, you know, how's it going to be used, which state, and you come up with the, with the decision, right? Is it taxable or exempt? So again, a process, and it starts to put take some of that, you know, um, decision process away or decisioning away from maybe someone who shouldn't be making those those tax determinations, uh, but not an automated tool. It's, it's manual still, uh, and then there's a manual process of making sure that those those tax determinations mm -hmm. are, are up to date. But the limitation here, Matt, is really obvious when you think about it. Um, so if you look at that chart and whatever decision tree you did came out to the answer exempt. Right. What if instead this was a purchase of a piece of qualifying manufacturing equipment in California where the answer is taxable, but taxable at the reduced rate. Yeah. If all you're getting is taxability taxable you're, and, and your vendor is not charging you the proper reduced rate, then you're paying far more tax than you need to. So really the, the a matrix with T's and E's is all well and good, but when you work in a world where there are reduced rates or partial rates and you need to know whether you're not, not only a vendor is charging you tax or charging you tax at the right rate at all the various jurisdictional levels, then that becomes a major effort to maintain something like that. Yep, exactly. And, then, and you're also at the, the mercy of the person filling out the, um, the questionnaire here to make sure they're getting it, the right thing in, right. In, in the right jurisdiction and so on. The next step along the way is with, you know, invoice review process. And the invoice review process, um, you know, manually verifying the tax made on an invoice by your vendor. Um, some of the advantages, again, not very complicated, right? Um, it's flexible, allows you to determine which invoices to review. So it goes back to that, you know, um, some intervention process where, you, mm -hmm. where somebody's making a decision, we're going to review these invoices. Um, it inserts some review by the tax department. So the tax department is taking control again of the purchasing process, or at least the now analyzing um, invoices that have been paid. Um, and then you can focus on problem areas or big dollar areas, like we said. So again, a, a part of the process, something taking some control over what's happening, um, not automation, but you know, certainly 
you know, a, a step in the right direction. You know, what are some of the concerns? Obviously, it's a manual process, um, labor intensive. We were with a, a client last week, a, a prospect, and there's one individual who said it takes about two and a half to three days per month for him to go through all the and, and do this. Right, so he's doing it manually. Mm -hmm. It's on a spreadsheet, so he can sort. Um, <laughs> and you know, he's got you know some data in there, but it's you know it's a solid two and a half to three days for this individual to go through this and, and flag issues or, or try to pull out information. And then once he does, he needs to go back to the invoice and to the or to the PO and find out what's going on and see what they need to do with that. So you know, Matt, we talk a lot about in this organization, and I'm sure the people across the all the organizations that are on this call. Talk about attracting and retaining talent. Giving somebody the work of manually reviewing invoices. Usually to do it right, you need somebody with experience and skill and understanding of tax. But that work is extremely unexciting. It is, it is, it is not something you want your top talented person to be doing. Exactly. Right. Um, the next step along the automation chain or the re review chain is, you know, automated tax tolerance processing. And so what you're doing here is you're automating those processes, you're taking that, that manual step away, um, and allowing systems to come in and review those invoices um, and determine you know, if what your vendors charge you is correct or not. Um, if it's not correct, what are, the, what are the differences between what they did charge and what they didn't? Um, some advantages, you can do this in two ways. You can do this as a real-time connection so it's connected to the ERP or your purchasing system. As those POs are created, you can do a call out and, and determine a, you know, a, an estimate of tax and then do a comparison when, when your invoice comes in from your vendor. Um, or you can do both. You know, you, on a batch process, you can then wait until the end of the month or an end of the week, end of the you know, period that you want. Take all those transactions and run them through the system as well and, and get those results or again, you can do a combination of those. Some systems you can have real time. Some systems you can do sort of a batch upload um, process. Works works with your systems and how you want to do it. Um, it's a it, it really matters. We'll talk about. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to sort of interrupt you mid advantage. But the the one thing we'll talk about is this idea of tolerance. It's actually no matter where you go into the spectrum and where you use automation. This idea of thinking about tolerances and how to set them and using them as a way to determine which invoices you review and you don't review it can be part of the equation, right? Exactly. Yep. Yep. And we'll talk about that in a bit. So, and again, here is you're, you're taking away that manual process, right? It's not a manual lookup. It's not a manual review of a spreadsheet. Here you're allowing systems, your systems, automated systems to, to review, to determine what taxes should, have, should be paid or should be collected. Um, and then ensuring that if things are wrong, you can flag those and, 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 and take care of them. Um, it allows all invoices to be reviewed, right? So you're not just sort of taking the top 10% or anything over $10,000. Um, you are in reviewing every invoice. Um, it allows the tax department to determine, again, as Chuck said, what are acceptable variances. You know, if it's off by a dollar, two dollars, who cares, right? Let it go. Um, if it's off by $10,000, then you want to check that one. <laughs> you know, and it's a it's a pretty robust approach, right? And you can help identify those problem areas. You can look at by vendor, by cost center, certain jurisdictions, you know, et cetera. Um, so a lot of advantages. What are some of the concerns, though? Right? What are some of the the, the things that the issues or the questions? You know, one is the initial setup is critical, right? So to automate this, you want to make sure that as you set your system up, that you have your what you're purchasing correctly identified the cost centers and various groups that are doing purchasing are correctly identified. The jurisdictions that you're buying into are, are correctly mm -hmm. identified. Um, and ensuring that that is set up properly to begin with, because if it's not, then obviously garbage in, garbage out, the old saying, if you have incorrect um, setup, you're going to get incorrect tax results, and it's not going to make this process any better. You don't, you're, not, you're not actually improving anything. You're not solving it right. Um, you know, if you do real time, it could slow the AP process, right? If you're inserting a step in, into the AP process real time, that could slow things down. Um, and you still have to set up a self-assessment process, right? So once you do it, and once you realize your vendor didn't charge you correctly, um, hey, I need to now self-assess this tax and, and make sure that it gets accrued properly. So. Um, the last 
piece, we'll, or the last automation section we'll talk about for this is evaluated receipt settlements. And evaluated receipt settlements, I guess, is sort of the Lamborghini of. <laughs> I, I say gold standard, but gold I guess standard, yeah. Uh, uh, of of AP process. Um, we'll talk about this more in a bit too, but for an automated evaluator receipt settlements process, um, it's an, essentially an automated process of determining the tax due and payable to your seller. Um, so it's essentially as you create the purchase order, you are determining what the tax should be on that purchase order and you're telling the vendor essentially what they will get for tax <laughs> um, with this purchase or with your, with your purchase. Uh, some challenges are it's a very it's, it needs a very robust system. Um, so first of all, you need to understand your nexus profile of your vendors and keep that up to date because obviously the tax you pay to them will vary based on their nexus profile. So if there's not a system in place for you to manage that and to keep their nexus the vendor's nexus profile up to date, it's going to make this system. Very, very difficult. To you're going to remit them tax. You're going to send them tax they can't remit. Right. Or, or you're going to withhold tax they should have collected. Right. Right. And, and cause them problems. Um, again, very robust approach. It has an immediate impact and positive impact on cash flow because you are not paying over taxes you shouldn't pay, and you're only accruing the taxes that you need to pay. So there's not this overpayment, underpayment issue going on. Um, puts all the tax determination in your hands, meaning you're not leaving it up to your vendor to determine if there should be taxable or not. You know what that piece of equipment is going to be used for. You know where it's going to be used. You know the rules in that jurisdiction of how it's going to be used. So you can accurately apply the tax to your purchases each and every time. Um, and the same, the, the flip side of that, Matt, is your vendor has to trust you to do that because no matter what you set up as an ERS system, that does not change the legal liability for tax. Exactly. And that's, and that's another concern is not all vendors are able to do this. Um, you know, the system, their sale system and your purchase system need to be connected. You need to be able to order electronically and submit those invoices back to them electronically. And some vendors just don't have the technical capabilities to manage this type of a system. So you may have the... the the process of, of, you know, some of my vendors are within the ERS system, others are not, and, and having to deal with, with two separate processes. Um, if you can get everybody on board, though, and everybody in, it, it makes this a, a very streamlined, very robust approach. Um, some of the concerns, in addition to managing a vendor's nexus settings, um, and not all vendors being able to, uh, to actually partake in the system, um, is, the, again, the initial setup is critical. You need to make sure that not only are your products and what you're purchasing is, is appropriately noted and, and, and mapped, and how you're using that is appropriate. The, the you know the cost centers are, are listed out and, and made and appropriate in terms of the mappings and, and what they do with those products. Um, and then the next step is the vendor nexus, right, and making sure that that's continually up to date and, and um, accurate. So with that, let's go to polling question number four. Uh, what type of AP process automation do you have? Does your company have uh, fully automated purchase process validation review, partial automation with some tools? Thank goodness for Excel. We have no AP review process, or I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and Chuck, as, as you know, we're, we're waiting for the results to come in. I don't know, as you talk to customers, do you see more of a concern from them on the AP side, and is this becoming a bigger issue, do you think, or is it something that's always been an issue and people are now just starting to have the well, ability to take it? It's always been an issue, but I think in light of decreasing margins and the focus on granular compliance, meaning auditors are going to become more persnickety, I'm seeing more organizations really sort of suddenly decide, okay, the time has come, I have no choice, I have to tackle the AP side of things. And now it pulls in, so actually the majority of folks have a partial automation with some tools, uh, and coming in nearly close together is, is about 20% have a fully automated system, which is great, and then just about 20% say, thank goodness for Excel, <laughs> <laughs> uh, which does not surprise me. Again, I, we have been on site with some, um, with companies of all sizes, and Companies of all sizes rely on Excel for their AP. <laughs> <laughs> so, Chuck, with that, why don't we talk a little bit about some of the Sobos tools 
that might be able to help in this um, and, and help give people an easier road to hope. Sure. So really the backbone of any AP automation tool, whether it's a SOAS tool or another, is, this, is the idea of a global tax determination engine. I, I sort of think of it as the backbone of the solution because if you don't have it, all you're really doing is putting a nice front end on what's going to ultimately be a manual, manual process which won't serve your need. And when you think about the global tax determination engine, what you need to think about is whether it, 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 it's, it's a mechanism that keeps rates and rules up to date and accurate because these things change. Those of you, all of you out there that are in the sales tax space, thank you for taking the time to be on this session because I know we are coming up on the busiest time of the year for rate and rule changes. My team is dedicated to it 100% right now. Uh, and, and, and it's got to cover the products and services that you buy. So, for example, a tax solution that doesn't have robust content for um, hosted software or that keeps those rates and rules updated as they change. If you're buying hosted software and that's being allocated across multiple jurisdictions, if the system doesn't know how to tax it, then it's not going to provide you any AP benefit. And that's the other thing, and that sort of dovetails with it. It has to have robust coverage. But at the same time, it also has to have flexibility. And I think they're equally important. Every single company out there that I've ever spoken to has something that's funky, if you will, <laughs> or unique, or challenging, or, or that's different about them. This sort of a use case or a business circumstance that requires them to do something different, requires flexibility, requires the engine to make a decision. So, for example, let's say you're a... Uh, a, a manufacturer that operates across 15 locations around the globe uh, and you buy accounting software that's used across all of those 15 locations. To get the tax right on that, you need to know the rules and the rates across those 15 locations and you need to have a tool in place that will actually take that one line item invoice and bifurcate it across all the... Uh, I don't even know what the word is, to, to, to allocate it across all those multiple locations. That's, that's a flexibility tool. That's something like the, the Sovos um, data editor that will allow you to take your information and turn it into something that's going to make for a useful uh, tax calculation. Very, very important in AP in my mind. Yeah, yeah. I think, and again, flexibility is, is very important and on the AP side. You know, and the goal is to, to use the standard content and everything that that Chuck's team provides, but you're right, on the AP side, there's a lot of nuances that go into what the correct answer is. So having the flexibility to create business-specific scenarios or business-specific rules, um, you know, if it's this product being purchased by this cost center, then it's a manufacturing, but if it's cost bought by another cost center, then it's actually not manufacturing, it's right. used internally, and we need to pay tax on that. Um, if, you know, again, allocating across jurisdictions for software purchases or, or other other items that are used in multiple locations. Um, the other one you often see is, you know, a jurist, you know, a, someone may actually get a, a tax break or, a, a, you know, a special, a special rate. rate for locating a, a manufacturing plan or an office in a particular location. Um, so you need to be able to manage those specific one-off negotiated rates and negotiated rules that you have with that tax authority. So again, standard content needs to be robust, but you also need to be able to, to drill into the details of each transaction, which is what makes AP complicated and, what, and, and makes it sort of the challenge that everybody has. Okay. So then you have that, you know, the determination just Chuck talked about. So you're automating the, the tax, like, or the call, and making sure that it's, mm -hmm. it's bringing back the correct taxable determination, tax exempt, or reduced rates, or, you know. A threshold, threshold or a limitation or something, that, yeah. You know, um, and then how do you actually implement that or how do you manage that? So the first one, again, is talked about with real-time automation. So here is the direct integration, right, between your ERP system or purchasing system you know, and into the, the tax engine um, for both the you know, purchase order and the AP modules. The tax is included on purchase orders, so meaning you, as you create a purchase order, there's a call out and, a, and an estimate comes back on that and is put on that purchase order. Um, and then as your vendor bills you, you then can reprocess that transaction and see if that tax the vendor billed you meets what you think it should be. 
And things can, you know, it could be they charge you the wrong amount. They overcharged you because they didn't give you the exemption that you're entitled to. Um, it could be that the rates change and they didn't capture a rate change. Could be the rates, you know, California implemented their new manufacturing reduced rate and they hadn't had that in their system yet so that you mm -hmm. missed that, that reduction. So there's a variety of things that you can do so that at the time of PO, you get a, an estimate of what that tax might be. And then you get to compare that to what the vendor actually charged you and, and do a, a real-time comparison of that. Um, you know, provide some media tax information for your forecasting. Uh, if the vendor is overcharging you, you can withhold tax amounts and improve your cash flow, right? Um, if you're using more than one ERP or more than one purchasing system, though, it does require multiple integrations, right? Mm -hmm. You need to integrate each of those systems um, to really make this, this, this process work. Uh, those implementations can be costly. Let's not beat around the bush. You know, again, sure making sure you're setting up these business scenarios can can it cost time and money um, to make sure you got it right. And then, you know, it, as we said earlier, it, this could slow the AP process because you are stopping invoices that maybe shouldn't be paid. Um, so there is a, a there could be a slowdown in in the AP group's work. Um, which could cause issues. <laughs> well, it could mean a that you miss out on discounts, and b that stuff doesn't get to where it needs to go in time. Right. So another option to talk about too is, is the batch determination option. And so here, what you're doing is is you're taking those purchases and they're being evaluated by that determination engine that this check talked about. Um, but it's at defined intervals. It's not it's not quote real time. It's you know weekly, monthly, um, nightly if you if you so choose. But you're not you're not inserting it into the actual purchasing process. It's a it's an extract from from your purchasing systems in a file. It's uploaded, um, run through the determination engine. So you're still getting the, the rules, the tax rates, the business logic that goes that is needed to actually assess these transactions. Um, but it's not at at the time at, at real time. Um, you know, some of the, the benefits are that again, it doesn't slow down that AP process, right? It's a bit more. It doesn't cost the same amount to implement or time to implement because you're not doing real-time integrations and doing that connection. Right. You're, you're doing a file extract um, and uploading that into the system. Uh, it does allow much more control of the process by the tax department. Um, it allows you then to accrue expenses and get them back into your ERP system, uh, or, sorry, not expenses, use tax, mm -hmm. uh, and put that back into your ERP system. Um, and it does not in, in, interrupt the AP process. You know, one of the drawbacks is you've already probably paid that invoice. Right, so you're you're analyzing that post paying that invoice. Um, so you may have overpaid it, the vendor if you have, and then you need to put in a, a process or a determination how you're going to cure get that, that. Right, get that money back, or or you know, um, in the future not overpay them again. Right. So you know, a, another way to do it, uh, another way to to look at 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 your invoices and make sure you have the tax department has control. Um, you know, as Chuck talked about tax tolerance process. And this is something we're rolling out here, we're pretty excited about. Um, so as part of that batch determination system, um, adding a process flow to allow for essentially tax tolerance processing. So val you know, you validate what the vendor charged um, on, the, on the invoice, uh, you run those through the tax engine, and then we look at those transactions and see what the variances are. Again, so you, you review every single transaction, and then there's a, a process where Transactions that perhaps fall outside the tolerances are flagged. You can see those with the red dots down here. Um, that will allow the tax department to go in and pick up those invoices and, and assess them and analyze them um, if there are a problem. Right. So you know, with this tool, the user can can filter through. Um, and again, based on business rules that they've set up. You know, let's say it's a a difference of if the tax differs by over $100 or it's greater than 10% of what you calculated in your determination, then you want to flag it. These are completely determined by the by each individual business and user um, so that then it gives the tax folks the, the ability to flag those invoices that they care about. And maybe you start high. Maybe if you haven't had a process before, you start with high tolerances and you really pick out the ones that are, are strikingly bad. <laughs> Um, clear those up, clear up the issues with those vendors, um, and then change the rules so that you make it tighter and tighter as you go. Um, it gives you a lot of flexibility in, in terms of doing that. 
After that, you can determine which of those transactions you want to post back to the engine or to the ERP, um, or those you want to set aside. So, you know, everything but those that are highlighted in the red, you want to have, you know, posted, accrue the use tax on it, and sent back to the ERP. You can do that, and then you can hold out those two that are that are problems, um, and make sure that they are fixed uh, before before you actually go back and post those. And the other thing is that you're then able to take that information um, and you'll be able to create those journal entries that you need to and update that information and send it back to the ERP. So, you know, again, a tool that we're rolling out now, very excited about it. Chuck and I are singing about it <laughs> <laughs> internally. Um, but a very powerful tool and something that, again, puts the, the control of this process within tax, makes it a very robust system, but also takes away some of those challenges when you have a real-time uh, integration or no integration at all, right? So and really, and really, Matt, what's what's what what the idea is, and what what when when considering tools and functionality in this space, you need to think about. It's really a three-step process. It's identifying the problem in some meaningful way. It's B. Um, then, if that problem means that you need to accrue tax, taking the step of actually accruing the tax because if you've only identified the problem, you've only done half the job. Right. And then three, posting the necessary accounting entries and using a utility or a tool that kind of makes all three a little bit easier, I think is where the true time savings comes in. Yeah, agreed, agreed. And I think it'll be a great benefit for those folks who decide to, to move, that, move in that direction. You know, and again, and the last piece we'll talk about is evaluated receipt settlements. Um, and as we talked about, how the, you know how these work is an electronic order is placed directly um, to the vendor. The purchaser creates that invoice, right? The invoice is then sent um, to the tax engine real time, um, and then pricing is determined, and the tax is uh, is placed on that invoice for your vendor. So again, you are determining the tax for your vendor um, and telling them the sales taxes you're paying to them versus the use taxes you're going to accrue. A very robust system, and it's a very, very, um, you know, sort of the, the top end of, of taking control mm -hmm. of this. I can tell you that we do have clients doing this right now. Um, not a lot, because it is a, a you it's know, a big step. It's a big, big companies, step. and it's usually big companies, and it's a, even for them, it's a really yeah. big step. Yeah. Um, but again, ensuring that, that that your tax termination engine can do that and has that proper type of transaction available and the rules that go along with it. Um, and also assessing your vendor's nexus is, is critical with that as well. So you right. want to make sure that you have that as well. So those are some of the options that we that, that you can use, right? The determination engine, using it real time, using it in a batch situation, or going to the granddaddy of all of our time value. So a variety of ways that you can you can take control of these um, and, and bring in and some some sense of <clears throat> calm and and, and Assurance on the tax side that you're getting it right. Control. Some right. level of control. Right. So with that, let's jump to our, our last polling question. Um, what are your biggest concerns for your AP tax compliance? Is it we don't have a process? Uh, that you're under accruing taxes due? That uh, you're overpaying tax to your vendors? Or both, B and C? Because if it's A, it's both B and C by definition. <laughs> <laughs> All of the above. Results are coming in. Uh, looks like uh, a good majority is both a, B and C. So I think, <laughs> uh, with uh, under accruing use taxes as, a, as as the second issue. So again, not not surprising. Um, kind of what exactly what we thought we'd, we'd see. What we see everywhere um, and for everybody we talk to. So we are now, you know, get, wrapping up here. Just some key takeaways. And I'm sorry, my screen keeps dropping on me. There you go. And as as we talk about takeaways again, if you have questions, um, you know, please add them to the question box. Uh, we will have a few minutes at the end here to answer some questions. Uh, but again, you know, some sort of the key takeaways. You know, a manual process. You know, cost business both in overpayments to vendors, um, as well as interest and penalty issues during audit. So, getting out of the manuals process, adding some automation to your to your organization um, is a win-win. You know, AP processes and use tax review is an area where the tax department can directly contribute to the bottom line. Because again, these taxes 
are the tax are, are the obligation of the business. They're not pass throughs. Um, and so if you're getting it wrong, you're overpaying. That's money out of your pocket. If you're underpaying and you're then being assessed on audit, there's interest and penalties that come out of this, you know, out of the out of your pocket as well. So this is a d area where the tax department can directly impact the bottom line. Um, when you automate, it allows those resources, those tax resources, to be focused on more strategic initiatives. Let's try so that talented person doesn't have to be re manually reviewing invoices. I picture them with a little green visor and a magnifying glass <laughs> and performing that task <laughs> with a candle no, no, no. <laughs> and no heat on either. Um, you know, and again, and there's multiple options uh, for automation control, and depending on your business needs and what you you have for systems, um, these options and, the, and these various ways to automate can be tailored to your specific needs um, and, and work well in, in any in any system. So, with that, Chuck, any final thoughts as we? Well, why don't we uh, make some time for questions here? I think we have a couple of questions brewing out there in the audience. Right. And we, we said we might have a hard time. We actually have a couple of minutes for it. Keeping Chuck under control. <laughs> so, Matt, here's a question that came in, and it really is something that we do hear from from our experience with, with talking to, 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 to businesses, is how does, how does this go from an idea to an idea in a company with momentum. How does somebody who is a tax manager who recognizes this risk and wants to do something about it, how does, what's the best way to get attention to somebody in the senior team who of course has a broad sense of broad uh, set of responsibilities who might not, at least at first blush, see the point of inserting tax into a process that's probably working pretty efficiently? Right. Um, Great question. And that this is something I actually talked about just a few weeks ago with, with uh, one of our clients looking to do an, a, an AP process. And really what you need to do is you need to show some dollars and cents, right? So take a, a subset of data that you, in your purchase side, where you have found that you have some issues, right? The vendors overcharged you or you, you have not um, accrued the, the, the appropriate tax. It could be looking at your audit history. Um, or taking, like I said, a subset of data for a month or three, three months and doing some analysis on that. Again, a lot of times these, these, these costs fly under the radar because they, they really don't pop out right away. You know, an audit may rise the level of, of rising some, raising some eyebrows, um, or it might not. It depends on, on the, the dollar value of that one audit. But if you look at audits over time, you know, things tend to add up. The other thing you can look at is, is time spent, right? So if you have somebody doing three days, of looking at a spreadsheet, what could they better be doing with those three days' time, and you know, and instead of just reviewing a spreadsheet with their magnifying glass and green visor? <laughs> um, so a couple of things, right? Look at the internal costs for people and the amount of time spent doing this manually, and then try to pull some data that has that, that you can then prove and extrapolate out. If we're doing it wrong for a month, how bad is it going to be for three years, right? And, right? and move on from there. If we're doing it wrong in X, Y, Z states what's going on with the entirety of the country. Exactly. If we're getting it wrong for these vendors, what's going on with every other vendor? Yep. And so one more question here, Matt. Um, and really it's a matter of like where to start. It's, it kind of presented a fairly daunting challenge to people. And I think this question comes from a point of, okay, like what, what, could, what could be done right away? What could be tackled first? Where's the best bang for your buck? Uh, again, varies company by company, but where's the best bang for your buck would be the areas that have the biggest risk. Um, and the biggest risk could be dollars um, or it could be lack of process, right? So, again, you need to look at that internally and say, whenever I buy things in California, I know we're probably getting it wrong X amount of time. You want to look there, right? Or if you're saying, I'm, every time I buy manufacturing equipment, I'm pretty sure that we're not getting it taxed for, or the appropriate exemptions, let's start there. So that takes an internal review, an internal process to say, where are our biggest risks and how can we how can we address those most quickly? Fair enough. So I think, Matt, that brings us pretty close to time. Oh, so we do have a couple of questions, other questions. Uh, one 
actually a recurring question is, will we share the slide deck? And the short answer is yes. Well, oh, I thought the answer was no. <laughs> oh, we are, okay. <laughs> uh, no, and actually this, this is, and someone else asked, is this being, it is being recorded. Um, it will be up on the Sovos website within, I think, 24 hours or so. Um, but, so you can look for that as well. Uh, and one last question for you, Chuck, let's see. Um, handling allocations is the question. You know, so you get TPP in one state, uh, but you're allocated, you need to use it in all other states. What's a good way to maybe manage that in automated systems? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And, and, and there are rules you can build in good automation tools that will allow you to make allocations decisions based on what you can loosely think of as a series of if-then if statements. If I'm buying this type of item and I'm buying it from this vendor or some other criteria, or if I'm buying it into this cost center, then really my uh, location of use where I'm using it is um, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Boulder, Colorado, Wilmington, Massachusetts, um, um, San Antonio, Texas, in the following percentages, 20% yeah. each or some other percentage based on your business requirement. Really, the, the idea to understand that there is that a good utility will allow you to build that into it and assume that that allocation is happening when it's that type of purchase made in that type of location. Right. Yep. All right. I think we're at the top of the hour. I want to get to all the questions we had, too. So perfect timing, Chuck. Excellent. Right time. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you, Matt, for, for uh, developing this presentation. Yeah, again, thank you, everybody, for, for attending today. Uh, if you do have questions afterwards, please don't don't hesitate to reach out and, and email us. We'll be happy to answer them. Uh, as I said, the slides will be made available to the attendees, and we will have uh, a recording of this up on the Sovos website um, in a very short order. Excellent. Thank you all very much, and have a good day.